Power to the Truth. This is Margo. This is Friday, February 15th, 2019, 4.38 p.m. Pacific Time, United States of America. So we have another packed show, and here it is, the end of the week, going into the weekend. Oh, by the way, it snowed here last night, a couple of inches where I live, and um, the roads are fine. They were all melted by uh, by around 12.30, 1 o'clock, because uh, the sun came out. But we have a huge winter storm up in the mountains. Uh, we've got road closures up in the mountains. They let school out today because the the roads were so treacherous this morning. And then, then everything cleared up for Reno Sparks area. And, you know, I got out and I didn't have any problems. But I have studied snow tires, so that helps. But, um... There's still storms, and we've got another round coming in tonight, and it's just that time of year, and we've had so much snow, um, they're, they're really not knowing what to do with, you know, with this, the huge snow pack that we've gotten in the mountains, and, um, I'm going to show you a report from Oroville today about the flooding over in California, so, um, yeah, we, and we've had a little bit of flooding here, because that snow, um, if it melts too fast, everything will flood, so we're going to start out with a new day's worth of methane data from CAMS, Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Services. Yesterday, I showed new data from Monday and Tuesday, and we can see that those two days are still there, and then they added Thursday the 13th. And I'm going to show you two views today. We're going to start on the Arctic view with surface level. I already have the movie queued up, and so this is where we left off on Tuesday. At the end of the day, we were seeing this huge release in the Laptev Sea of this red, dark red, and then the dark brown, which um, these are levels uh, like 20, 21, 20, to between 2,120 20, 2, to up to 10,000 parts per billion. It could be anywhere in between there. We just don't know. When it gets into that brown area, is such a huge range from 2160 to 10,000 parts per billion but we know we know it's it's phenomenal and it's bad and so that was covering up this this Kara Sea and then it was releasing over here off this um, this is where that East Siberia ice shelf is and I have an article about that today too so, um, and then it's, it's in the red. We've, we've rarely seen it in the red coming up. And it, this is surface level. So it's coming up through the sea ice in the dark up there, in the cold and in the dark and in the, in the middle of winter. And, well, the sun is starting to come up up there. Um, I peaked at NASA Worldview, um, a few minutes ago and the sun is about up here on this um, top island of Novaya Zemlya and so the coastlines are coming into view but um, on some of this area but it's really cloudy and you can't really see the sea ice so <clears throat> um, until I can get a good view I don't you know, we're just not going to spend a lot of time looking up there <clears throat> until we can really see what we're looking at. So here the movie is now running into the forecast period. We see it spread is spreading out all the way across to Greenland 
and down and around all the coastlines and into the Canadian islands, moving across the North Pole, moving over to Svalbard. Now I'm going to pause it. Here is at the end of Wednesday. This So this is the actual data that we have. And so here we see this large red line going all the way across and now moving into the lap tab C and then it coming up here and actually um, coming up off the northern uh, northern coast of Alaska and um, I'll show you something real quick too and then this big release in Russia I'll show you let's look at climate reanalyzer real quick <clears throat> um, I haven't looked here today at 2 meter temperature anomaly but um, it's been red up here on on the Alaska coast let me um, I've been saving these so um, I can show those I can show the two meter temperature anomaly. Hang on. Um, I'm going to pause the record. Okay, I found the folder. I just didn't want to be scrolling through to. Um, so here's. I've been saving these two meter temperature anomalies um, and the sea eyes and pre precipitation. So um, here it is from yesterday. I'm going to open it with Honey View. So um, when we look back now look it was really red up here in this North Siberia area. This was yesterday the 14th now here it was on the 13th and this is this is the day that we're seeing this methane release um, from from the coast of Alaska so here's here was the 2 meter temper temperature anomaly and we can see that it was actually Canada um, let's go back another day. Here it was where Alaska was covered up. So this was from Tuesday the 12th. And look at that. So this is what it looked like for 2 meter temperature anomaly meaning that the temperatures were this much warmer. It was up into this red zone at least 20 degrees Celsius warmer than normal all the way across Alaska, this northern part of the Canadian Islands and northern Greenland, and also over here in Russia and Siberia where we're seeing a big methane release too. So I think this is this definitely is pertinent to what we're seeing. So with that in mind, so that was from Tuesday and so here this is remember this is at the end of Wednesday so it had been it had heated up and now it now the release is coming on Friday so a um, couple of days a couple of days after that the red it was it was releasing so it looks like the release comes a couple of days after the huge heating so here it is coming across so I just find that really interesting and then in the forecast period we have another building here and now it started over so all this stuff that was building is now releasing and then moving across and then it all kind of kind of fades away by um, 
it's Saturday, and then we start to see another building starting here uh, Saturday into Sunday. And then that's the end of the forecast period at the end of Sunday. So we can see another big build up here. So, and so when we looked at Climate Reanalyzer, we see that it's red. See? It's red up in this area where it's building. So, I think it's totally related. And so, it's good to combine our research here with the different things that we look at and then we can understand more of what's going on. So, um, and I also uh, pulled up the North Pole view so we could have a better view of the Northern Hemisphere because it's really showing this dark area coming up from Europe. Um, I thought it originally it was all from the UK, but it's really not. It's from Europe, France, and uh, Germany, and these, these, these countries here. And now look, at the end of the forecast period, look how it moves up in this ocean here, in this sea here. Um, is that the Baltic Sea? That's between England and Norway. Let's see. Let's just look at the earthquake map. That's one thing it's good for. It's got all the seas named. Oh, that's the North Sea. So that methane is just just bursting up. Um, so it's coming up from France, um, Germany, and I um, think this is the... Um, uh, the Netherlands and Belgium, so it's building, building, building uh, Denmark, and and then it's releasing, and part partly from the UK, but mainly coming up um, from the North Sea. So maybe there's permafrost melting under there. I don't know. So. Let's move so you can see it right here coming up. So let's run it again. And then, of course, we've got China and Asia covered up over there. We've got India, a lot of India, and, and out of the Indian Ocean. This is the Indian Ocean here. And then this is the Tibetan Plateau, where it's blue with much lower levels, which is called the Third Pole that we learned because of all the glaciers there. So, and then we can see that it's it's uh, much lower down here in Mexico right now. So... So it's directly related to temperatures and also the humidity level that's in in the air. I'm thinking. Okay, I'm going to pause that, and I'm done with those. And I think I'll make this one as my my backdrop for today. I hope you all are enjoying these daily shows. I'm sorry that they go long. Um, seriously, it's my therapy. If I was not doing this, I would literally be going crazy. And <clears throat> I would just be beside myself with, with what's going on and, and all this. But at least this gives me a positive outlet. So um, I thought we'd follow up with this big, big dust cloud 
that was moving across to New Zealand. Here's what it looked like yesterday. Um, well, here here's what it was from two days ago. And then it moved up um, on the 14th, and here it is on the 15th. It's kind of fizzled out, and it looks like it's now up um, hitting hitting the northern island and um, of course we have a slice and dies here we've talked about that before so that dust cloud it looks like it's kind of fizzling out so there's that I will leave up NASA worldview in case we want to look at it some more and um, that river, that muddy river that was created from all the floods is still here and see the mud is flowing into the ocean. So that's the state of the Queen, northern Queensland area. So um, now we're going to, um, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to look at um, the Hutt River in New Zealand and this this is located on the northern island you know New Zealand consists of two islands they've got the northern island and the southern island and um, here's the northern island and the Hutt River is a really really important body of water because it provides water to all of these cities and towns and settlements and stuff um, all the way down for like 50 56 kilometers or something like that and um, it flows okay the Hutt River flows through the southern North Island of New Zealand it flows southwest from the southern Tararua range for 56 kilometers. So it's beautiful. It's so beautiful down there. It's just so sad how our world has just been polluted and taken over. And it's just so sad. It just breaks my heart because it's just so beautiful. And so when we zoom in, we see it runs right through these towns. And I don't know how old this, these pictures are from Google Earth, but whenever these pictures were taken, you can see how low the water has gotten in some areas. Um, this, this is not water here. This is, this is the, um, the bottom of the of the le of the um, of the river that's the riverbed and that's dry and you can see that's totally dry or I don't okay I'll have to have Robin tell me um, it looks to me I don't know if that's the riverbed or if that's the shore the shoreline but it looks to me like it used to be the riverbed and and that the water just it just is just is down to nothing in some places and I don't know if that's how it's supposed to be or not but um, anyway so this is what we're going to be looking at today because the Hutt River is in trouble and um, Robin just wrote a new blog post on it and he reports on the Hutt River because this is his neck of the woods where he lives. Robin Westendra from uh, Seymour Rocks blog that's, that's the name because that's the name of his horse Seymour Rocks and so it's robinwesternra.blogspot.com and he just published this today and it's already Saturday in in New Zealand because they're like 
17 or 18 hours ahead of where I am. So it's Friday here, Saturday there, and he says an update on the state of the Hutt River. And I promised him that I would share this whole blog post today because Facebook banned it from being posted. I was able to post it on my timeline, but he he was he's was not able to to post it. They said that it was abusive, so um, so I t I promised him I would share the whole article today, and we've got more news too. So just sit tight, and here we go. We're in a global crisis, but I like to monitor what is happening in my own backyard. Stats indicate that Hutt River flow rates are half of what they were last year. And so here's a picture, and we can see where this is the riverbed, and this the river used to come way up, but now it's just like barely there. So maybe I was seeing the riverbed. More on the unreported sorry state of the Hutt River. And if you click there, um, he has blog posts from year to year and time to time reporting on the Hutt River. And so this goes to one of his, one of his archived blog posts on the Hutt River. The Hutt River water source for the whole region is in deep crisis. Today it is raining. There is some precipitation which has wet our garden table, but no more. Recently, I listened to a discussion between Jeff Rents and Dane Wigington in which they were talking about conditions in California in which they described um, the conditions in California. They described how it would be rain which would provide moisture to at most the top inch of soil, but never replenish moisture in the top soil. The authorities can present information so it looks like an isolated event, an anomaly. However, I have been looking at this for a number of years with an observant layman's eye, and I have seen no evidence to counteract my theory that droughts come and go but within that, there is an ongoing process of drying out. In addition to the, quote, rain, unquote, there is another anomaly. It is one of a handful of days where the temperature has sunk below 20 degrees Celsius, which is the mean maximum temperature for this time of the year. If I had to think of a ballpark figure, I would say that most days for weeks, for weeks, the temperature has been hovering around 25C up to 27C. Personal anecdote, admittedly, I cannot think of a summer here that has seen wetter than usual conditions. For that matter, outside the odd flood, I could possibly add winter to that. Unfortunately, I'm not a gardener, but it may be an interesting exercise to dig down in your garden and see what the condition of the soil is below the very top inch, which may be moistened for a while, but returns to its usual dry conditions very quickly. Certainly this is not the worst year I have seen, but there are some worrying indications because they are likely to represent a trend. And then here's a video on toxic algae in the Hutt River. Hutt River Toxi Algae Alert. Greater Wellington Regional Council is warning swimmers to stay out of the Hutt River from Kaitoki Regional Park to where the river meets Wellington Harbor. This is due to the risk of swallowing pieces of toxic algae. Toxic algae is naturally occurring, but poses a significant risk to human and animal health if ingested. Because of the warm, dry weather, the toxic algae bloom in the Hutt River has increased significantly, 
and pieces are detaching from the riverbed which poses a risk to swimmers. Even small pieces of toxic algae can be fatal to people and dogs if swallowed. Young children are particularly at risk due to their size. We advise against swimming anywhere along the Hutt River until further notice. We're working with regional public health and local authorities to inform people of the risks, but we encourage you to know what toxic algae looks like so you can avoid it and stay safe. The black shadow in the video is the algae. Well, let's play this. I hope I don't get a strike. I think it's off of Facebook, so... So it looks like it's this area, this, this plat, uh, over to the right hand side of where the, where the water goes. Rainfall Anomaly Some quite useful information has appeared provided by the Greater Wellington Council. And then here's their rainfall. The different arrow symbols that you see on the map show current river and stream flow levels value shown as percentage of normal stage range. Um, so anyway, uh, you can read this if you want. And he's, he says, I find the following graphs, which I've always taken from the same location, um, Taita Gorge, to be rather unhelpful. And so he's showing the different things. Perhaps the most in indicative thing is the absolute value given for the day. And I think this is the the um, the flow. Okay. Um, on February 16th, 2018, it was 6.960 um, cubic meters per second. And today, February 16th, 2019, it's 3.5E588 cubic meters per second. So it's half. It's literally half of what it was this time last year. Soil moisture. This confirms dry conditions along the Hutt River, but appears to me to underestimate just how dry things are. This region has been affected by the hot summer, but far less so than other parts of the country. In particular, with floods last year, now drought and fires in the Tasman district at the top of the South Island is the area worst affected. And then he includes this Tasman. In the news today, Tasman facing serious drought. The Now remember where Tasman is. Let me show you that. The Tasman area is in this southern southern island on it it's it's this north is this whole north region is that's what's the Tasman area and they've been having wildfires all the way through here here's Nelson it's actually this okay I'm I'm I got to correct myself I think it's this whole area here this whole northern area, including this this part that goes out and this part that goes out. So I corrected myself on that. But it's that northern part of the southern island. The Waimea Plains, cradled between two mountain ranges, 
are usually immune to such extremes in the weather. But a Tasman District Council water scientist says the wider area is facing its worst drought since 2001. Joseph Thomas met with MPs and opposition leader Simon Bridges today on the Waimea River bed, which is now flowing at its lowest level in decades. And there's the river, what's left of it. See, there's the, the river bottom riverbed. The region hit by two large extropical cyclones a year ago, which sluiced out hillsides and tore through homes and crops, has been stricken by a large wildfire over the past ten days. Now it's as dry as a bone with no immediate relief in sight. Mr. Thomas, who's been working as water scientist in Tasman since 1992, said the situation is now dire. This is as bad as I've seen it since 2001, but then the river went dry, but a lot later. We're earlier by a month, so if it doesn't rain, we'll be in a dire situation. And then here's his censor message. That's the end of the article. He says, I tried, po P.S., I tried posting this on Facebook, on a Facebook group, and was blocked because this is abusive. So when you click on it, and I have to get my magnifying glass to read it, it says, warning, this message contains blocked content. Your message couldn't be sent because it includes content that other people on Facebook have reported as abusive. If you think that this doesn't go against our community standards, let us know. So, they're even censoring the reporting of this stuff. Now, I was able to share it on my Facebook timeline, but he wasn't able to. So, Thank you, Robin, for reporting on the state of the Hutt River. We'll be praying for all of you down there and, um, you know, hope that everything works out. But, you know, this is, this is the state of the world, like I was saying yesterday. And we're going to be seeing more and more and more. And you just wait and see when anything when they do get any kind of rain it'll probably be a deluge and they'll be they'll be flooded and i mean the kind of rain that's good is the slow soaking rain because that's what soaks in you know you don't need a deluge of of everything you don't need it to just pour down a year's worth <coughs> excuse me a year's worth of rain in in uh, in a day, you just don't need that. Okay, our next article. We're gonna leave Australia for a little while, and these articles are just kind of mixed up. You know, I just as I find an interesting one, I just paste the link in in my show notes. And I decided that's how I'm going to do it. And so it's a grab bag. So here is, this is from Vox.com. And this is from today, the 15th. It says California has 149 million dead trees ready to ignite like a matchbook. 18 million trees died just last year. This poses a huge fire and injury hazard. Well, you know, it doesn't stop at the state line. This looks exactly like um, up, at, up at Mount Rose now when you go up there and you're just driving down the highway. But this is from um, the Stanislaus National Forest. And this picture was taken on July 22nd of last year. So, um says California has just emerged from two back-to-back -back years of record-setting fires including the campfire the state's single most deadly and destructive blaze on record 
which killed at least 86 people in October 2018. On Monday, the state received a fresh warning sign of why the risks of massive devastating blazes like it are growing. According to the U.S. Forest Service's latest aerial survey of federal, state, and private land in California, 18 million trees throughout the state died in 2018, bringing the state's total number of dead trees to more than 147 million. The concern is these trees could be matchsticks for another conflagra conflagration or that the decaying timber could maim a hiker, a ranger, or a firefighter. And they said they actually had a decrease in tree deaths compared to 2017 and 2016, but it's still far above what they want, etc., etc. And here's the progression of the tree mortalities. And it's awful everywhere, not just in California. Um, but they did; the, they were the ones that did the study. And they say if high temperatures and dry weather, uh, the weather conditions that ramped up fire risk in 2018 recur this year, the state could face an even larger forest fire than any seen before. And they've been the trees have been dying in mass for years in the West. That's absolutely correct. When I first moved here, two thousand and five, it was beautiful. And then a few years after that, uh, the trees I started to notice the trees dying. And they're saying it's bark beetles and this and that. But I think it's from cell phone towers and the the ozone. You know, we, we have not as much ozone now, and just the whole thing. I think it's just the whole thing. Um, so I'll leave a link below for that article if people want to watch it. Um, but we've had so much rain and snow. I know that's going to help with the fire season, but, you know, it'll dry out fast. It'll definitely dry out fast. So, what's our next article? Storm creates chaos in California with flooding and mudslides. This is from APnews.com. And this is uh, from out of Sa Sausalito. This is from yesterday. And here's a picture of look at this big huge tree that fell and the, the cars that are in the mud it says cars and large trees are seen in a debris trail in the aftermath of a mudslide that destroyed three homes on a hillside in Sausalita California on Thursday February 14th the National Weather Service says the atmospheric river sagged southward from Northern California overnight and is pointed at the southwestern corner of the state early Thursday. Well, you want to look at that? Let's see where it is. Let's go back. And here's the storm. Here it is. And, and see, it's coming all the way across. And here it was from the 13th. I mean, we've had storms just coming across all week. It's been literally for the last week. And um, here it is today. And so now it's moved on over here to the Reno area. See? And so it's stuck in the mountains coming all the way down there right now. Waves of heavy rain pounded California on Thursday, 
trapping people in floodwaters, washing away a mountain highway, triggering a mudslide that destroyed homes, and forcing residents to flee communities scorched by wildfires last year. They did evacuate. I know that. They did evacuate a bunch of people. At least two people died as the powerful systems swept in from the Pacific Ocean and unleashed damaging rain, snow, and wind. The system was moving across the U.S. West into Wyoming and Colorado after walloping Northern California and Southern Oregon a day earlier. A woman pulled from rising water in a low-lying area between these mountains and L.A had a heart attack and died at a hospital. The unidentified woman was one of nine people and three dogs rescued in a flood control channel where homeless people camp. So the homeless people got caught with the when, when it started raining and then it flooded and it's it's awful. It's just awful. Here's a mudslide in north of San Francisco that barreled over cars. Let's watch this one. So we're, we're here. Look at that. Oh, he's talking. I just want to see the pictures. This is a YouTube thing. I'll probably get a strike. Look at that. There's the car stuck in the mud. You see that? Wow. So that's what's going on. Um, it's not that bad over here where I live. But, um, so let's move on to the next story. Because we've got comments and earthquakes to cover too. This is from Oroville News Live, and I cover this because of the dam up there, the Oroville Dam that I'm very interested in. And a lot of times we see earthquakes that happen when they're blasting up there and doing work. Okay, this was from today, February 15th. Update flood warning issued for Friday, February 15th at 9.23 a.m., expiring Saturday the 16th at 2 p.m. by um, National Weather Service. So you want to see where Oroville is. In case you don't remember, it's down here. Here's Chico. There's Paradise that, that the whole town got burned up. Here's Oroville and here's the dam. And um, They've had some flooding to some of these rivers, the Feather River. I saw a report that the Feather River had flooded and they had to evacuate some people. So that's where that is. And here's the dam. And that was the dam that had to be rebuilt. Update, flood warning issued February 15th. Okay, I've just read that. Aries affected Butte County. Uh, Butte, California, Glen, California, Sacramento River at Tahama Bridge, Sacramento River at uh, Vena Woodson Bridge. The flood warning continues for the following rivers in California. Sacramento River at Ord Ferry. And it, it goes through the whole thing. They've got minor flooding is occurring and minor flooding is forecast. And the flood stage is at 114 feet. And the rivers have been either right at or sometimes right above or just a little bit below. And then they're expecting more rain and everything. Now here's a map of the, the this is the flood warning. This is Northern California, and here's um, Nevada over here. 
Now we see Nevada has re this Reno area in northern Washoe County and going down to California has a winter weather advisory and then the pink is winter storm warning so that's snow and then the flood area is here the green coastal flood advisory over here so this is this the whole bay area has a coastal flood advisory so that's what's going on in california now what's the next one we've got three more you think we can make it through i'd like to because if I don't, then I have to save it for the next show, and every day I've got new articles. Okay, this one is from The Guardian, and now we're going to go visit Siberia. This one is called Toxic Black Snow Covers Siberian Coal Mining Region. Activists say post-apocalyptic scenes in Kuzbass highlight man-made ecological disaster look at that car it's covered that's that's called black snow and it's from the coal mines they had these open pit coal mines and then when it when it snows and the wind blows it turns into black snow and it's very dangerous so this is from today, the 15th. Residents of a coal mining region in Siberia have been posting videos online showing entire streets and districts covered in toxic black snow that critics say highlight a man-made ecological catastrophe. In one video filmed at Kaselyansk, I don't know how to say that. A town in the Kuzbass region, a woman drives past mounds of coal-colored snow stretching to the horizon, covering a children's playground and the courtyards of residential buildings. The scenes in the footage were described as post apocalyptic by Russian media. The coal dust that turns the snow black in the Kuzbass comes from numerous open pit mines that environmental activists say have had disastrous consequences for the health of the region's 2.6 million people with life expectancy three to four years lower than Russia's national average of 66 for men and 77 for women. Cancer child cerebral palsy and tuberculosis, tuberculosis rates in the Kuzbass region are all above the national average. It's harder to find white snow than black snow during the winter. There's a lot of coal dust in the air all the time. When snow falls it just becomes visible. You can't see it the rest of the year but it's, it's still there. So they're breathing that in and the dust contains um, uh, heavy metals including arsenic and mercury so they're they're breathing all that in and when when it rains and the wind blows I mean it just goes everywhere so there you go so you know each each area has got its own problems seriously Okay, we got two more. This one is a sad one. Okay, we're going back down under. This is from ABC um, from Australia. This is from uh, from Wednesday. Queensland grazers say cattle are too shell-shocked after flooding to find food. Look at those poor, poor cattle. They are just, you can see their ribs, they're just starving and they're just barely dragging their butts along. And so after the floods, they're just, they're in shock and they don't know, the article says they don't know what to do. Um, 
they they can't they don't even have the the wherewithal to go and graze and get their go go for food and some of them like here's a dead one poor thing um they're lame they're shell shock um there's the picture of the flood and here's here's a picture of a whole bunch of them that got stranded and look at the water all the way around and they're stranded they don't know what to do so and so they're using helicopters to round them up to to encourage them to go to a certain direction to higher ground so I will leave that article below if people want to see that and last but not least ta-da I mean I'd be shell-shocked if I went through what those cows went through too this one is from Live Science and I'm going to close how can I get rid of that ad I can get rid of that part um, this is from Life Science and it's from November of 2013 it's still pertinent today though I thought I'd share it and it says twice as much methane escaping Arctic seafloor so if we put this in perspective that this was over five years ago and there was twice as much methane escaping the Arctic seafloor what do you think is escaping now seriously so I'm not going to read the whole thing it says the Arctic methane time bomb is bigger than scientists once thought and primed to blow according to a study published today in the nature in the journal nature geoscience and this I mean this could be written today and this is regarding the Natalia Shikova study and everything and um, so here's the here's the uh, methane coming up in the bubbles everyone has seen that and it's home to shallow waters up in the Arctic I hate it when those things come up I can never get rid of them and um, here it says methane gas formerly trapped in permafrost on the East Siberian ice this East Siberian Arctic shelf is leaking into the atmosphere so this was over five years ago Arctic storms churn the sea and speed up the release of methane it's like stirring a soft drink releases gas bubbles so if people have not seen this article I think it's it's a really good it was written very well um, for the first time in 20,000 years the Arctic Ocean has warmed up seven degrees in the summer and that's entirely new because the sea ice hasn't been there to hold the temperatures down that was from Peter Wadhams so it's warmed up more than that now saying if we have a methane burst it's going to be catastrophic etc so I will leave the links below oh I have one more thing to share I have another picture to share hang on let me find it I'm gonna pause this while I find it okay I have a treat for you since we just talked about the methane are you ready I can blow this up so that we can get a good look this was put together by Sam Carana and these are pictures of the methane for four years starting in 2009 this is the global I mean the northern North North Pole view here's Greenland here's Siberia and so forth so this one was from January of 2009 I know it's a little bit blurry but um, I'll blow it up so you can get a better 
picture of it. See, this is from January 2009, and we saw um, a little bit of methane here um, coming up north of Norway and then down here um, in the Atlantic Ocean. I don't think this is surface level. I don't remember exactly. Um, and then here's 2010 at the same time of the year. Look how red it is. And then look over here in the Pacific Ocean off the coast of Russia. There's Kamchatka and um, here's, here's Siberia over here. Here's 2011 look at the increase look at the red It's come all the way around greenland and it's spreading out over the over the arctic now and look at how much redder it is and then 2012 it just is more saturated um about the same but more saturated and here's 2013 look how dark dark it is there I don't know what this scale is. I don't know what it's supposed to be. I can't read that. It's too blurry. But um, I just thought I'd share that with everyone. So that was over five, well, that was five, six years ago now. That was from January of 2013, and now we're in January of 20, or February of 2019. So we're six years past that. I would like for, to see what he's what it's going to look like now from his view from his data so that's the actual science of it so that was that was six years ago it's probably all red up here now so now let's move over to comments and we'll just kind of breeze through these i think our first comment these are I think these are mostly under my video from yesterday. G Wendy 42 says it's snowing in the summer in Tasmania. Meantime in Berlin we had no winter to speak of and spring is here already. It's weather weirding all right. Thanks for your important information Margot. I know it's a lot of work but so important. Well, thank you, G. Wendy, and thank you for the report from from Berlin. Um, I love getting these reports from around the world, and it's like all my friends live in faraway places, and I don't really socialize where I live, so, you know, I know a few people, but I kind of keep to myself, and um, I'm chatty here with all of you because I feel comfortable, so... Thanks for being here, and thanks for the report from Berlin. And yeah, it is weather weirding. And then Michael Berlin, um, he left a long post. I may not read all of this, uh, but I, I'll start in. He says, here in the USA, the same in the West, far West mountain states and central states, it's called weather whiplash. One day it's 10 and very cold, and the next day 60. I'm getting reports from Colorado, Missouri, and Illinois, and it's all the same with complete whiplash. Storms having two sides, one hot and the other cold, very unnatural. I put in over a thousand hours in geoengineering research, and the U.S. is the leader in climate engineering. However, China and Russia are very close behind. These programs are done with HARP, SBX radar, ionospheric heaters, and ice nucleation. Look those items up and it's proof positive, not a conspiracy, conspiracy theory. Um, and I'm going to let people read the rest of this comment for themselves. themselves. Um, I totally agree with everything he says. I just don't want to spend the time going over all of this because I've gone I've talked about this stuff before and he leaves links. Oh, by the way, this Pacific Redwood link is broken. It doesn't work, Michael. So, you might want to come in and edit your post and fix that. Um 
so he says and I, I presented this article owning the weather by 2012 I presented that um, anyway he says take care and the very best in the future oh and if you have any questions feel free to ask so we appreciate you bringing this to the table but um, I'm not not going to spend a lot of time on it right now because we've spent time on it in the past and I'm more focused on what's what we're looking at right here right this second but thank you Michael for being here and thank you for sharing all that information for people and I totally agree and I totally I agree with everything you're saying I totally agree off-grid John says we are stuck between fires at Tabulum and Tenterfield there are many planes, helicopters, and trucks working hard. Send prayers for all those who have lost their homes and face danger. God bless. Absolutely, we need to be praying for all those people down there. And these are this is part of, of, of that Western Australia area. So thank you, Off Grid John, for, for um, reporting and for, for being here with us. Oh, and Valhalla says her name is Margot, not Margot. Well, they don't know Valhalla. They, they, they're thinking of the French. You know, a lot of these people who are overseas, you know, they think of it as the French spelling. So, um, I just go Margot, M-A-R-G-O. But I, I answer to M-A-R-G-O-T as well the French spelling so um, thank you off grid John for being here then Bill Franks says Lake Neos or Nios world's deadliest lake in Africa once killed 1700 people overnight and we still don't know why and so there's a short YouTube video on that and Valhalla I think he was being cheerful playful he says Yes, that is weird. So thank you, Bill Franks, for that link. And um, people can look at that. Darren Koppel says, thanks, Mar Margo. You're welcome, Darren. Thank you for being here. Victor Cohenberg says, today in the Netherlands, it is warm sweater day. The idea is to encourage people to think about climate change to wear a warm sweater so they can turn the heater 1C lower. Because usually this time of year is cold, freezing cold, but today it is 15C in the south of the Netherlands where I live now. So perhaps today we can use this warm sweater to wear it outside so we don't have to wear a jacket. Unfortunately, many people here do not understand what is going on they cheer this welcomed warmth. Yeah, they, people don't have a clue. They just don't have a clue. They, you know, and this is, this is what the dark side does. It tells, it's saying it's, oh, it's so good. And, you know, enjoy the warm weather. And, you know, everything's melting faster. And this and that. And look at all the benefits. And they don't have a clue what's coming. But thank you, Victor, for the report from the Netherlands. I appreciate it. And I hope you're um, settled back in with your family and, and that you, you're going to be spending some quality time with them now. Michael Berlin says, Thanks, Margot, and please stay strong. God with you. Thank you, Michael. I am staying strong, and God be with you too. And thanks for being here. Sensible Hair says 20C here in the Algarve. Most think it's quite normal for this time of year. Soon me thinks they won't see it like this. Anyway, as ever, thanks, Margo. You're welcome, Sensible Hair, and thanks for the report from Algarve. Would people like to see where that is? Here we go. 
it's in Portugal and it's a beautiful place and it's right down there and it's a beautiful place so now we know where sensible hair is from so thanks for being here sensible hair then Seymour Rocks, uh, Robin Westenru remarks, What really shines through, Margot, is your empathy and compassion. You care for the humans and animals and what is happening half a world away that is quite apart from your thoroughness and attention to detail. Oh, thank you, Robin. That is such a kind, sweet comment. And um, I appreciate you you saying that and you know I think you know when when we talk about creation and life and what's happening you know if if we are kind-hearted and you know have feelings and and are sensitive you know it's it's hard not to have the compassion and the empathy but I make it a point to look at all the different places as much as I can in the limited t amount of time that I have so thank you Robin for your comment and thank you for your research and sharing and all of that and your friendship so now I'm afraid this is turning into another long report so it's just the way it is. Now I'm going to close out Google Earth. We may go there again. You just don't know. Now we're uh, looking at USGS for the last 24 hours. Uh, earthquakes of all magnitudes and we're showing 287 worldwide so we definitely have an uptick so that's almost 300 13 more and it's 300 now in the two and a half magnitude and higher range we're showing 36 so let's see what the oldest ones are that we need to cover here's a 2.7 in the geysers california that one was at 628 last night. Here's a 3.4 near Kodiak, Alaska. And then 4.5 Indonesia is the next one. So let's go. Let's just start down here. In the South Pacific and move around move around we're going to start with this one in Fiji or near Nadoi F Island Fiji a 4.8 that happened last night at 7:47 p.m. and it was quite deep 582 kilometers deep and when you see them that deep it's going to move those tectonic plates around the planet we're going to see movement and we're going to see magma magma moving and we're going to see extra earthquakes kick up and then there was a 5.3 near Hihifo, Tonga this one came in at 5.40 p.m. this morning and another deep one 293 kilometers deep so these were in the ocean near that red line large that 5.3 was a large one all of these times are Pacific time because that's my time zone and it's just easier for me to think think in my time zone now next we have this one north of Papua New Guinea 4.7 near Kaviung this one came in last night at 8.29 p.m. right next to that red line next we have um, this one 
to the south of Maluku, Maluku Island, or uh, Sep Sepurua, Sepurua, Indonesia. It was a 4.4. This one came in last night at 9.06 p.m., 110 kilometers deep. Next, we had um, this one off the coast of this um, um, near Nisano Dua. This was a 4.5 that came in at 6.50 last night. 82 kilometers deep. Now moving on up here a 5.2 near uh, Tarragona, Philippines. This one happened this morning at 8.20 a.m. 82 kilometers deep. All these are in the ocean. It's amazing how they just all end up in the, well, most of them end up in the ocean because if they were happening on land, they would be causing damage. Now, 4.9 near Walian, Taiwan, off the coast there. This one happened at 6.08 this morning, 46 kilometers deep. Moving on up. Here's one off the coast of Kamchatka, Russia, a 4.6 near Petropavlovsk, Kamchatsky, Russia. This one happened at 3.21 p.m. today, 66 kilometers deep, right near that red line. So we're not seeing any any on land. I'm sure there are some that happened. They're just not being reported for whatever reason. Now let's get catch this one down here. Um, a 4.9 near South Georgia Island region. And this one came in last night at 6.56 p.m right near that red line. Next is this one literally on the coast. Well, it looks like it was mainly in the water. Uh, 4.5 near Coquimbo, Chile. This one happened at 11 p.m. last night, 35 kilometers deep that was not big enough to cause damage. Here's one on this red line. A 4.7 near the central on the central east Pacific rise. This one happened at 447 this morning. <clears throat> Next is this one off the coast of Mexico, a 4.4 near Salina Cruz, Mexico. This one happened at 11.22 last night, 27 kilometers deep. Now, let's go to, I think that's all of the international ones. Now, let's go to all magnitudes. Let's go to Hawaii next, so I don't leave it out. We've got five here today. We've got a 1.9, a 1 1.8, 0.7, 2.0. This was right at um, zero kilometers depth, and a 1.9. And that's so they're, they had a slower day today. Um, let's go to Dominican Republic next. We've got a whole cluster here. 
let's see we're, we're on all magnitudes and we've got 10 here so let's let's get all these in view it looks like this is the biggest one a 3.0 that's getting up there uh, near Punta Cana Dominican Republic this one happened at 950 last night 85 kilometers deep <clears throat> then a little one here on the west coast west end of Puerto Rico near Anasco a 2.5 it was a hundred and five kilometers deep this one came in last night at 851 p.m. and then we've got all of these clustering up here north of Puerto Rico Um, we had the biggest one up here it looks like was a 2.5 and then up oh, nope 2.8 2.7 oh, 3.0 at Punta Cana so we had um, had some 2.7s and 2.8s so they're they're moving moving up in magnitude and then there were there were a couple of little ones on the island there too so nothing nothing super major there now let's move up to Alaska let's move to our two and a half magnitude and higher map we're going to start with this 5.0 near Adak, Alaska. This one came in at 10:11 this morning, 38 kilometers deep. This, these are part of the Aleutian Island chain. Uh, 2.9 near N Nikolski. This one happened at 1:15 this afternoon. Then at 5.1 near False Pass. That happened this afternoon at 2.54 p.m. So these are some large ones. Um, larger than we've seen in a while. Uh, 3.4 near Kodiak. Last night at 6.30 p.m. 2.5 near Kodiak. Uh, yesterday. Oh no, today at 5.35 p.m. Here's one um, near Valdez, Alaska, 3.2 at 9.05 this morning. Then a 2.7 near Nikiski at 8.32 this morning. Very deep, 249 kilometers deep. Normally we don't see them that deep up here. 2.5 near Talkeetna at 8.07 last night 3.7 it's getting up there near Kobuk at 2.57 this afternoon so those are all of them two and a half magnitude and higher up in the Alaska area so now let's just take a peek at all magnitudes up here see how many we can get on this map okay that's all of Alaska and we're seeing 83 on the map so is the definite uptick in number and we had some larger ones and then we also had more smaller ones so the rest of them are under two and a half magnitude so they're just peppered around but um, here's 2.1 2.3 2.4 kind of mid twos 2.0 low and mid twos 2.5 so um, it's like it's building here's a 2.1 so it, it just seems to be that the magnitudes are just building gradually and then here's our cluster in the Anchorage area. We've got 22 here today. 
and when I backed out now there's 53 that we're looking at right here <coughs> now let's move on in down to the lower 48 we're going to start with this one on the Juan de Fuca plate it's a 4.0 near Port Hardy Canada this one came in last night at 10:27 p.m. Now let's cover this northwest area while we're here. We've got four here, uh, 1.4 near Normandy Park, 1.4 near Des Moines, Washington, 2.8 near Shelton and another 1.4 near Normandy Park. So the largest one was this 2.8. So we're not seeing any blasting yet unless I spoke too soon. Here's um, 0.8 near Amboy. Remember Mount St. Helens is right here so this is oh no it's right here sorry. Um, Mount St. Helens is there so this is southeast of Mount St. Helens. A point eight and let's move on across to Yellowstone area now we've got 12 here today and um, I'll just call them off 2.2 near Chalice 2.2 near Lincoln, Montana, 1.2 near Lincoln, Montana, 2.3 near Hoback, Wyoming, 2.4 near Hoback. Were those in the same place? Yep. And they were um, 8 minutes apart. No, a little bit more. 20 uh, about they weren't very far apart from 118 to 136 so a little over 15 minutes apart 2.3 and 2.4 so again we're seeing pairs here's a microquake a minus 0.2 at Jackson Wyoming right over here 0.6 near Clinton, Montana, 1.5 near Chalice, 1.7 near Chalice at a minus 3 kilometers depth. So we've talked about that. Could be signifying magma moving up in the chamber. Here's a 1.2 near Lincoln, Montana, 1.4 near Lincoln, Montana, and our first quarry blast of the day for us to see that caused a 1.6 magnitude earthquake. This one happened at 12.02 p.m. this afternoon and it was at a minus 2 kilometers depth. It happened right up there. Now let's move on down to, to Utah. They have activity going on um, right down here Remember we saw some in Salt Lake, the Great Salt Lake? Well, we've got a cluster going on here. A huge cluster. Oh my gosh. It was just a few this morning. We've got 37 clustering here. And they're calling it um, like between 1 and 3 kilometers south of Bluffdale, Utah. This is, this is incredible. Um, there has to be magma moving. There just has to be. Uh, the biggest one was a 3.7. So that was close to a 4. So we're getting up into some sizable earthquakes here when it's a 3.7. And then it's um, all these. And it, this all started at 12.20 this morning. Remember this is last 24 hours. And then the next one, this was a point 0.1 that started small. And then a point 0.8 at 2.18 this morning. 
then a 0 0.5 at 241, and then a 3.2 at 402, then a little tiny one at 0 0.5 at 409, and then a 3.7 at 409 that happened 20 seconds after this one that was a 0 0.5. Then a 2.2 2 at 411, 0.5 at 413, 1.7 at 414, 0 0.6 at 420, 0 0.3 at 420, 0.7 at 433, and so forth. And it's just been coming in, coming in, coming in. Here was a uh, 2.2 that came in at 8.05. Then these were in the 1's range since then. And the last one was a 1.1 1 .1 at 2.42 this afternoon. So that's, that's pretty incredible, 37. That's pretty remarkable right there. So... We're going to definitely keep an eye on that. Then, directly southeast of that was a little lone one, a 1.3 near Fairview, at a minus 3.4 kilometers depth. So we know that that epicenter was up in the mountain. And then down here at Farron, we have some more. I thought we were done with these, but we have four more at Farron. Um, uh, 1.8 that came in last night at 6.49 p.m. at a minus 0.7 kilometers depth. And a 1.4, 0.9, and 1.1. And this one, this 1.1 happened at 12.13 this morning. So... There's that. So Utah is rocking. Then we've got one down here in northern Arizona, a 2.5 near Fredonia, Arizona. And this one happened at 1222 this morning. We normally don't see them there, but that's part of that North American craton that we, sh we saw yesterday. We saw that picture. That's part of that that um, unstable edge. Now let's do Nevada while we're down here. We've got a little lone one over here, a 1.2 near Piochi. And then um, it's picked up down here um, in this Nevada test site area. We've got 12 in the area. They're small, but um, that's where they tested nuclear bombs underground. Here's a micro quake. It's a minus 0.4. But that's where they tested the majority of the nuclear bombs during the Cold War. Right in this area. The Nevada test site underground. And a lot of above ground testing too. And whenever you have that, it's such a huge blast that earthquakes were were made at the time that those bombs went off and it created weak parts weak points in the crust of the earth and so it's still still we still get earthquakes here's a 1.8 near austin nevada at zero kilometers depth this one came in last night at 6 23 p.m and here's a pair of little ones, a 0.2 and a 0.4 near Hawthorne. Walker Lake looks good. Here's, okay, Carson City had one. 1.1 uh, 1 .1 near Dayton. Here's Dayton. They've had some flooding down there with the rains. Uh, this one came in at 3.20 this morning. Lake Tahoe, Reno looks good. Let's see if there's anything else in Nevada. 2.0, we got that. 
did we get this 2.0? 2.0 near Austin and a 1.8, so another pair within an hour, um, less than an hour. This one happened at 6.23 last night, and this one happened at 7.01. So in less than an hour, that pair came in. So we're seeing them in pairs for whatever reason. Now, let's hop over to the geysers. I don't think there's anything in Northern California. No. We've got 29 at the geysers today, which is a large number. This is an old volcano. And... Um, they're using this for uh, geothermal to uh, to provide electricity and stuff. So, and it's creating earthquakes. So, 29 there at the geysers today. Then moving on down, here's one um, in in the San Francisco area, well, near San Jose, a 2.2 near Milpitas. This one came in at 1019 this morning. Coming on down this west side, a 1.0 near Gilroy. Here's a 2.7 near Tres Pinos, right on the San Andreas fault line. This one came in at 7.03 last night, 1.7 near Pinnacles, 1.4 near Pinnacles, here's some more, 1.4 near New Idria, 1.3 near San Lucas, So, um, Mexico looks clear. Let's zoom into Southern California and then we'll get the east side. And we've got 50 on the map here today. I'm going to go right down here first with this huge cluster. Um, this is where, okay, see the San Andreas fault line and how it kind of we don't see it where it goes through that Salton Sea. When it picks up, it becomes the Imperial Fault Line. So that's the extension of the San Andreas Fault. And so here we have this cluster of 21 right here on this Imperial Fault Line. Um, they're calling it uh, near Holtville, California. And they were low twos and ones range. Here's a, the, I th looks like the highest one was a 2.3. But these swarms, these swarms like this are important because it's showing movement. And, and something big could come out of one of these. Here's one on the edge of the Salton Sea, a 1.7. Something big could come out of all of, of any of these swarms. Here's a cluster of 7 near Julian. These are small, but again, they're clusters showing movement. Now let's come on up. What's happening at Kawea today? Uh, it slowed down. I guess it, well, we've got nine on the map here. Normally we see a whole bunch right over here. So maybe, maybe the magma has moved to some other places and causing these other swarm, other places to swarm. So we've got some little ones peppered through. Um, Ludlow looks quiet today. I think we're done with the Ludlow swarm. Now, uh-oh, I missed that one. 1.8 on the coast near San Simone. 
at 116 this afternoon. Now I'm moving across. There's a 1.4 near Lake Isabella. Now um, I'll call them off. 1.3 Olancha right up here. 1.3 Olancha. So we got a pair there. 0.6 Little Lake and 1.3 Coso Junction. Okay, I got all those. Now here's Mammoth Lakes. And we've got seven here today. I'll highlight them and call them off. A point eight, point two, two point four. So that's the highest one so far. One point three, two point one, one point eight, and point six. So we still got movement here. And nothing at Mono Lake. And I think that's a wrap. So we'll zoom out and see if. Uh oh. We've got stuff. Okay. This one is. Is this one? This one is new. This one came in. This is a 4.7 near Benkulu, Indonesia. This one came in at 5.27 p.m., 35 kilometers deep. So this was off the coast of Sumatra, over here in the ocean. And there's Benkulu. And it looks like we've got some more up in Alaska. 2.5 Kodiak at 535. Um, this one just came in at 1.7 near Big Lake, Alaska. 2.2 near Redoubt Volcano. These have just come in. Uh, 1.2 near the geysers. Here's a 2.5 near Kodiak. So these are good size. I mean, they're not nothings. And then I think that's pretty much it. So things are things are happening fast. They're happening very fast, and. You know, I have to report every day to keep up with everything. I can't not report because I would miss all of this. I would miss 289 earthquakes. How could I miss that? How could I miss the methane? And all of our news stories and all of our comments and our sharing and, and um, you know giving each other good wishes and and praying for each other and so this is why I do what I do because I do believe we are in the end times and we're seeing signs of this every day with the quickening and with the the, the extreme in the weather weathers and weather extremes and now the earthquakes since I started on those and and it's going to get more and more extreme. So I would like to encourage everyone to keep posting in the comments section where you're from, what the weather is like, any anomalies, uh, whatever you feel comfortable with sharing or any research that you found that is pertinent to what we're covering. And I'm happy to share that as well. So I love you guys very much. I recommend everyone get your spiritual houses in order right now. Uh-oh, this one just came in. 3.3 uh, .3 near San Antonio, Puerto Rico came in at 554. See, that's just since I've been 
since I was over there. That's brand new. That wasn't there before, I don't think. No, I don't think it was. So, um, I recommend everyone get your spiritual houses in order and um, do it now because you don't know when the next breath might be your last. I love you guys very much and until next time, God bless each and every one of you. Go in peace and good night.